welcome to a very windy Ascension Island. So we've now made it up to Hayes Hill and the site in front of us is the old site of the now removed Governor's Cottage, um, also known as Bates's Cottage after I believe Captain Bates, one of the captains of the ships probably who commissioned the building of the cottage. Um, in the early mid 19th century there was a, there was a small battery of two, uh, two smoothbore guns up here, this was known as Cottage Battery. And I believe they probably sat on this uh, this bit of land here, very similar to construction to the to the possible battery we saw down at the at the harbour. Uh, we've got English Bay in front of us, large sandy, shallow bay, which would have been great for landing small boats and troops. And that was protected by by these two guns um, of Fort Bedford. So this is the uh, late 19th century Fort Bedford. The guns were laid down in 1863, I believe. Um, so the fort couldn't have been earlier than that. But we have two um, seven inch rifled muzzle loading guns, uh, hydro technology um, of their day. This design of rifled muzzle loading guns didn't really change um, because breech loaders came along reasonably soon after. Uh, we can see, now this, this, this battery, before I start, this battery has been preserved and there are a number of elements of reproduction, um, furniture on the carriages and so on. So it's not, it's not entirely original, um, however I believe the, the guns, the, the pivots and a lot of the metalwork is original. And that's what we can see here, we can see the, the race at the back, this is where the, the wheels of the, the rear of the carriage would have sat to allow the gun to, um, to slew round. We have the anchor bolts at either side here that would have been used for the for the rope of the gunners to, to pull the guns round um, to aim them. Coming into the centre of the gun with the another inner race here. Um, I believe this was an A pivot because of the, the shape and the configuration of the arms of this pivot and a smooth bore cannon has been used. Um, possibly a 64 pounder has been used as the pivot so these guns are likely to also have been installed at the island at some stage and during the upgrades um, the, the smoothbore cannon have been used as, as pivots as the, uh, the, rifled, the rifled guns are installed. Uh, two, two beautiful examples they have been really well restored by, uh, I think by soldiers and the local history group here. It really, there really aren't too many parts of the world where uh, where armaments like this exist in, in with, with such context. Um, if we look, if we look behind us on the hill, we can see the two five and a half inch breech loading guns of HMS Hood. They were the last additions installed during the Second World War. With these seven inch rifled muzzle loading muzzle loading guns. Uh, we have the the smoothbore cannon as the as the pivot, and then down on the hill we have uh, Fort Hayes in the distance to the south side of the harbour, and we have Fort Thornton um, on the the north side. So all of these forts focused around the harbour. This is the this is the vulnerable point of ascension. Georgetown being the capital. Um, this is where the majority of the population lived for really for the first hundred years of, of habitation on Ascension. So we'll 
We'll now leave the 19th century Fort Thornton and we'll, uh, sorry, Fort Bedford, and we'll now make our way up to the two guns of the 1903 um, upgrade, the last battery to be constructed on Ascension. <music> So I'm now up here in the battery observation post at Fort Bedford. Uh, Fort Bedford was the last fortification to be built on Ascension with construction starting in around 1903. Uh, the two guns we see here at the moment are later editions with the original guns being stripped out after the First World War and these two 5.5 inch uh, breech loading guns from HMS Hood being installed during the Second World War. Thankfully, during the Second World War upgrade, very few of the original early 20th century features uh, were left intact. So we'll have a look uh, around this battery. We'll see some of, the, uh, some of the magazines and other features up here at Fort Bedford. So as mentioned before, the two guns that were installed at Fort Bedford at the start of just before the start of the Second World War were 5.5 inch breech loaders from HMS Hood. They've been here ever since, they were never decommissioned. Uh, they have been they have been preserved or work work was ongoing. One of them certainly uh, from a few years ago was was still rotating on its on its original bearing. But unfortunately now they've they've fallen into, into a certain amount of disrepair. You can see these fittings would have been brass or are brass, but they've they've been painted and the the brass is starting to, to corrode and and come through that. So with the, the two seats where the, the crew can adjust, manually adjust uh, the azimuth and elevation. Uh, 1915, the gun was manufactured, breech loading 5.5 Mark 1. In need of a little, little bit of work to to preserve it again and make sure it's it's fully restored, but still in the current condition, still a a remarkable remarkable survivor. Two remarkable survivors. There's Georgetown in the distance. So we're down here in the protected part of Fort Bedford. The first of the guns in front of us on the right, the second gun on the other side of the fort. And as I mentioned before, it's it's really in such great condition, uh, having been modified during the Second World War, but very little damage being done, or very few features being lost. So coming down into one of the structures, the magazine of one of the guns. We have hooks on the wall and I believe these were for fire buckets. So be judging by the concrete these may have been a later addition but I think these hooks were as I say for, for fire buckets should, should a fire break out inside the fort it has to be dealt with pretty rapidly. Coming in a little bit deeper, we have what is probably a shell store. 
we have the uh, the lamp recesses as in Fort Thornton with the same lockable brass shutters. We also have, and this, this confirms the shell store status, so we have some ghost writing. We have service shrapnel uh, relating to the rounds, the, uh, the projectiles that we used. Uh, we have lidite for practice. So we have some lidite filled shells um, to be used for practice. In the back here we have what would have been the shell lift. So the shells would have been loaded onto the mechanical lift and taken up to gun surface level up there. Some wooden buttons in place that would probably have have lined that shell lift. Oh, and here we have some more. We have service service lidite shells for obviously for, for firing operationally and large large double double wooden doors still with the the wooden frame and and fittings so a very nice original shell store and actually if we if we look at the walls here the whole fort looks as if a, a form of of camouflage paint or certainly dis a disruptive paint pattern has been has been applied to it with this very strong uh, sort of yellow paint um, in here this is a this would have been a, a water tank um, either for for living or for uh, for using for for dicing and uh, cooling and cleaning cleaning the barrels of the guns. So coming back up top, we have um, what I imagine would be would be ready use lockers for some of that some of that ammunition that would have been uh, stored above ground for immediate use. And one of the things is possibly unusual is the. It's the large number of steps the crew would have needed to, to elevate to get to the guns. Um, I'm not sure what original guns were here, but it may have been that this this brick wall is a later addition. Um, I'm looking at the, the construction method, I would, I would suggest it probably is, with the original gun level of the First World War in our 1903 year, probably been here, most likely been in a in a bit of a recess or a pit. So the whole profile of the battery would have been much lower at the time. Coming down to the second subterranean store of this of this gun position. So if that was the shell store, then this is the um, propellant of the cartridge store. And immediately I can confirm that that, that is the case. So if we look in front of us, we have the issuing hatch. So I'm not sure if there's a cartridge lift on the inside, but the cartridges would most likely have been, have been issued through this hatch. We have a lamp recess loaded from the outside to keep the lamps away from the inside of the store. But more importantly, we have what seems to be a really well-preserved shifting lobby. So there would have been uh, hooks up top here, and that would have been for the workers' dirty outside clothes. We didn't want to bring contamination of stones, grit, dirt into the cartridge store. Here, these two posts uh, would have formed the barrier to the shifting lobby. Um, so an NCO on duty, uh, or a magazine worker would likely have been this side, and only permitted entry once others had had derobed their, their outside clothes um, onto the hooks here. And then on the inside, they would have had their, their cotton magazine clothes, probably with a bench here with rubber sole shoes um, for them to go in and work. 
in the cartridge store. So a really simple room. And on a day like today, it is remarkably cool in here, given the 35 degrees it is outside. We've got the entrance door, we've got the lamp recess, and there's that issuing hatch. So it was through this hatch that all the ammunition was, uh, all the cartridges would have been issued. There was no, no cartridge lift, it seems. Uh, still with, with the wooden, uh, wooden countertop. Um, so they would have been issued over wood and not, not over stone. So a stunning little Victorian cartridge store. Back through the shifting lobby. It's another lamp recess. This one isn't in the cartridge store, so it can be loaded from the from the outside. Upstairs again. So those are the two magazines of the, the first gun position. So let's now take a walk around the rest of the battery and see what's re what remains. So up at the uh, surface level of the battery is this this small lean-to store. The only thing I can equate this to would be that it's a, it's a lamp store. So this is where the lamps used to light the shell store and the cartridge store would have been kept on the thick wooden shelves. An actual fact, if you, if you look at the staining of some of the wood, they may indeed have held held oil lamps, some of which has leaked and helped help preserve the wood. You can see see some of the wood which which maybe hasn't been hasn't been soaked. Um, yeah, something like this doesn't doesn't always remain at, at other batteries, especially around around the UK where the damp conditions just destroy um, everything wood and biological material. Uh, so yeah this may indeed have been the been the lamp store for the magazines. Now, this little mark is great to see, and on most artillery batteries you will find it. You may recognise it as, a, as an Ordnance Survey benchmark, but in actual fact it is just a survey benchmark. In particular, it would have been used to find the height, or to mark the height of this battery, um, above, probably above mean sea level. The reason why that's important and the reason why it's at this particular point of the battery is because this is where the plinths for the rangefinders are located. There are two rangefinder plinths, uh, likely one serving each gun. So we can see the relationship between that, that plinth and the gun. And it was from here that when targets were identified, uh, probably from the battery observation post just up the hill that the individual gun crews then would would work out the, um, the firing calculations for for their respective respective guns. Now these may be additions uh, for, from the Second World War to serve the five and a half inch uh, breech loaders um, but yeah these two these two range finding plinths arguably the the most important part of any battery without without an accurate range um, and declination or dip um, to the target um, you'd be wasting ammunition so we have the two range finding plinths up at Fort Bedford we've now made it over to the second 
gun position which is just behind me here and there are a couple of really interesting features which which we don't really see um, as we mentioned before in the UK because of the the environment so the first one is these vents so these ventilation holes will go down to the ceiling of the shell store which is below me now there is a an iron handrail which is probably now 120 years old still looking in remarkable condition but if you look closely the handrail has a an eyelet at this side and a hook on this side so this handrail would lift up there would most likely have been a uh, a daffet crane or some way for the crews to wheel the ammunition so this is the shell store access below us wheel the ammunition down this ramp um, up to here open the barrier and then be able to hoist the ammunition down into the into the magazine and actually these two sockets here that you can see in the wall that would have they would have held the uh, the simple davit for a, a block and pulley uh, system to lower the ammunition down so that's really nice to see that still in situ if we come over here this is the top of the shell lift that we'll see when we go down into the magazine so down in there is the shell store and the cartridges would have been lifted up on a conveyor um, manually powered using a handle uh, from the shell store so let's go down and have a look then at this part of the magazine So here we are, almost at magazine level, and we can see if we look above us, this is where the, the daffet, the little crane would have been to hoist the ammunition down. We have a, um, a window for light. We have the, the double doors, double width doors again, and almost identical to the first magazine we saw. We have the hooks for the fire buckets. We have some, some shells that I'm not sure of the purpose of. And if we make our way in, here we have the shell store. Looking up at the aperture we saw at ground level. This is where the shell lift would have been. With the same vaulted ceiling. Lamp recesses here. We have some counts on the wall which may relate to ammunition but more specially we have service pointed common ammunition on the other side we have we have for practice uh, marked up as the lidite shells Surface armor piercing ammunition also stored here. And service shrapnel. Shrapnel for attacking ships to, to try and kill the occupants, whereas the armor piercing to pierce the armor hulls. Yeah, another, another lovely shell store. Really well preserved because of the, the environment out here. Now, we should be able to find the corresponding cartridge store. We 
which actually is proportionally quite a long way away from the, the gun itself. So if we look, if we look where the, the, the shells came up, we have our we have our gun above us here, and then all the way over here will be the magazine or the cartridge store. So let's descend. Based on the other cartridge door, we know really what to expect. We have the, the lamp recess here, we have the hooks. There we can, we can see where it's been painted around the benches for the workers to, to change. We have the issuing hatch with the, the wooden work surface. The, the shifting lobby barrier would have been here, another lamp recess. And yeah, here we are in the, the cartridge store. Really put down powder room, which probably something you'd find in a theatre. But a cartridge store is probably a, a more suitable term, powder room. Uh, probably would predate the technology of this battery. So there we have the magazine and both magazines of the um, of Fort Bedford. So let's have a look up and before I move down to the coast again, we'll have a look at the, the two remarkable guns from HMS Hood. Here we have the remarkable second gun. I believe it was only a few years ago when this was this was spinning around, but it's now now sadly dropped and is is stuck in position. So here we have there's a unique story about about these in the shield. There are two large holes punched uh, and I think possibly some other other pop marks on the front so I'm not sure anybody quite knows when when the shield was was shot those are those are large caliber weapon holes uh, 20 30 millimeters probably um, it's, it's possible they were shot during the uh, during the Falklands when troops came to Ascension on the way out to um, to retake the Falkland Islands um, and maybe got a little, little trigger happy during a practice. Um, but yeah, it's not not often you see you see battle damage on guns that um, are probably in one of the sleepiest parts of the world. So let's let's go around the front and have a look at those. And there we are, there's the front of the shield. There's a, a couple of shots that didn't quite penetrate and there are the, yeah, the holes that, that did. Quite impressive, whatever, whatever fired those did, did a tremendous amount of damage. Um, and certainly any occupants inside would have, would have regretted that. So next on our stop, 
now that we've completed Fort Bedford is right down the bottom to Fort Hayes, the last of the Georgetown Ascension Island forts on this tour.